Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thanks to you to Shana and to all of the organizers. Um, it's been just a joy to sort of go through the planning process and to speak, with Sharon, to speak with Sharon and to just think about how to make this the most productive and enlightening talk for you. Um, I had the great pleasure, as I was telling Sharon, probably a year or two ago, to, to see her speak in conversation with the um, artist and educator Mark Tribe at 21C in Cincinnati. And it was easily the one of the most inspiring, enlightening, entertaining talks that I've seen in the last five years in Ohio. And so it's, it's such a pleasure and such an honor to, to be the interviewer, the interlocutor tonight. And Sharon is so gracious when she comes on stage with an artist. She really sort of defers and gives them the platform to celebrate their work and their thoughts. And so I'm so excited that we get to celebrate her as an artist and a writer and an educator tonight. <laughs> Thank you. That's so, so kind. So I'm going to... No I, pressure. Yeah, I wrote... <laughs> so I wrote the, the questions out a little bit just because I want to make sure I get the wording right. Okay. So Sharon, as part of the, the, the two first books that she wrote, um, Living and Sustaining a Creative Life, Essays by 40 Working Artists, and then The Artist as Culture Producer, Living and Sustaining a Creative Life, you conducted a 62-city tour for the first book, um, promoting performing, sharing the ideas and the essays and the stories, and then a 102 city tour for the second book, where you have systematically celebrated the many artists that have contributed essays and stories, as well as the wider community of creative professionals that have become part of this community. But the bedrock of this project is your work as an artist, which you have maintained throughout. You've presented work in major venues, you've had it acquired into collections like the National Gallery of Art and the Whitney Museum, and your work has been written about in the most respected journals. What is the origin story of your creative life? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, nobody's really, oh, we're gonna pass the wand. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, first, I wanna say thank you for this opportunity. I wanna thank Colleen so much because um, she first contacted me and which, is really a testament from an artist to an artist, which got me here today. So Eva, Shana, and Colleen, but she really started this. Um, and thanks for, for talking with me. Um, so it's interesting, no one has asked me this, and no one in the last five years of me doing this has ever interviewed me, so this is very uncomfortable, <laughs> because I usually do the other way around. I'm always on, the, on, the, on exactly, what you're doing. Exactly. Okay, so, um, but I prepared a little bit for tonight, because we, we spoke um, the other day. Um, the origin of how I sustain a creative life. So I graduated from, as Shana said, from School of the Artists of Chicago and then Yale University, but I graduated with 102,000, no, $150,000 in debt, not 102, I was thinking of the tour. And that's the equivalent of $206,000 today. That was in 1991. Um, I'm married to um, uh, my husband, Vincent Vallejo, who's uh, my project manager, manager, but he's a jazz musician and political activist. So the two of us are our own family. I'm estranged from my parents who I came from a divorced family, middle class family, but I paid those debts off as an artist in 10 years, and I'm very proud of that effort. And I think that the, the reason um, that that occurred was because I applied for everything that fit, meaning that I applied for things that I, I felt that were a connection to my work that had the same speaking of the same visual vocabulary. I also, in my life, 80% of the opportunities I've received have come from cold calls, not physically picking up the phone, don't ever do that, calling people, I've done that, it's really bad. You probably wouldn't recommend that, right? No. <laughs> um, but just reaching out to people to be able to um, start a dialogue, because I never thought about um, opportunities being the end of something, but actually the beginning and uh, develop relationships with people to build a community. So I sustain my creative life is 70% comes from projects that are from those relationships that I reach out to usually. I rarely actually get called for um, things. I usually comes out of developing relationships. Um, and then 
29%, no, 29.9% comes from um, uh, teaching, speaking engagements, uh, working with nonprofit organizations. I work with the Joe Mitchell Foundation. I've worked with the Ford Foundation and the Tremaine Foundation. Um, but then 0.001% comes from these books. Uh, because I split the royalties with the artist evenly. It's an artist project. So each of these books, um, th this book I got 8% royalties, and then I negotiated to get 10% royalties um, up to 2,500 books. We far surpassed that, and now we're at 12%. But I split the royalties 45 ways in this book. Um, and that was a check for $88.78 a person annual. The first check for this book was $10.04. Amazing, <laughs> right? But the point is that to try to make it sustainable and everybody got their own copyright. So that answer a question? That was a long answer. Well, and also how did you first come to art? How were you first how did inspired I first to come become to art? an artist? Oh my God, yeah. no one's ever asked me that actually. <laughs> um, I think I came from, uh, I, I mean, I'm going to get personal, but I don't care. My therapist told me that um, that I came out uh, without any Teflon coating. I have no filter. And I think I just was really different than the rest of my family. Um, uh, I, I just, my family never fully got who I am and have, hasn't still. There's a few family members who have. Um, but I think that I needed to have a voice, and I think that art was my voice and always has been. I've always said that it's my truth. And um, one of the reasons why I did these books is because um, I believe artists are not only so important to uh, contribute in the drive of our economy, but we really give to the well-being of others. And I see that so much. And it takes a lot of courage for artists to share their truth in these intimate ways. Um, and I felt, I felt like that, that was my community. And I do feel like my work is um, and I'm, I feel like at 54 years old, I'm finally coming into my work after all these years. Um, and all of the work I do is my work, not just the installations I make, but all of the activism and the books and the lecturing, all of it. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Perfect. Perfect lead into my second question. <laughs> So in concert with the rigorous activity of this tour and the many conversations it has spawned, as well as your continued work in arts education, you maintain an active practice and have found a way where they both coexist and complement one another. Thanks. We've all heard about this elusive, mythical thing called balance. How do you find and achieve it? No sleep. <laughs> um, no sleep. Um, but ha really happy in the things I do. Are you happy too in your creativity? Yeah, but I just wonder because you're, you're working in painting and drawing and animation right, and installation, but then you're also doing a very social sort of dimension social. of this practice, but you find the way to sort of have Put it them, together? Yeah, complement one another. The last, the last installation I did, so I make these big um, projects. I like making environments that um, create engagement conversations for inclusivity and engagement, places for inclusivity and engagement. Um, the, the last piece I just did, which is up in Wyoming, in Larry Moore, Wyoming, is a museum in, it's called the, the University of Wyoming Art Museum. And when I was first approached to do an installation there, I said, why don't we get the universe, uh, I'm sorry, the Wyoming Arts Council together to be able to, um, work with them to visit artists and to share how we can come together in the state of Wyoming. I always like to ask what artists need and want. The materials that I use for my installation are, are usually um, high reflective aluminum um, sheets that are actually rare. You can't, you can only get them, I just found out after all these years in working with it, you can only get it in one place here in this country. So we've been getting it from Canada. And the tariffs that actually have just been um, uh, increased have really affected me as an artist. But I'm an artist, I, I can only imagine how they affect people who need to make aluminum cans for their living, for example. Anyway, so um, in, in putting this project together with this installation, I just think about all of it being together. So like an installation for engagement, which means then I can meet artists, I can work with partners and nonprofit organizations, 
Um, I can go and visit artists and bring us all together. I can learn from them. But I balance it out by thinking of it holistically. Um, practically how I balance it out, I've, I, I think to be organized is really helpful. I think to be disciplined is really helpful. A lot of the things I've learned from these artists in these books are that. Um, I have a really good database. I think being pragmatic, having a great database, and having a really good mailing list, I have a very good mailing list as your currency. So to be able to create um, and cite who your audience is, understanding who your audience is, understanding who your community is, understanding what people need and want, and, and also offering, like it's, it's not, for me, I don't do things just to do it for myself. I feel like I, I want to be able to ask what, what, what I can do for others. Hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, so your, your work, some of your work comes from what we associate with a traditional studio background or studio practice. And yet you've built and you continue to build a vibrant social network between and amongst artists. So how did you choose the contributors to the book series? And what prompts did you, did you offer them? Great question. So when I, I was first approached, um, so you never know who's in the audience. Like I don't even I know a lot of the people in, the, in this audience. Um, but uh, I, I moderated a panel for the College Art Association. Has anybody ever heard of that organization? C, collegeart.org, CAA. And um, they have an annual conference. And one year, uh, I moderated a, a panel called How to Make a Living with or Without a Dealer. And 400 people showed up at that. And I, I had made a comment like, wow, it's really great that you're here. And it really sucks that you're here, because then you're so shows you're so dependent on this one system. I don't think people like that so much. But we unpacked it. And it was a panel of people there. Well, in the audience was my publisher. And I, I guess I was good that day because she came up to me and said, we really want you to write a book. And I said, I can't even write an artist statement. I cannot even, I can't write, I can't write an artist statement. The artists in this audience are laughing with me, right? Um, so I was I can't do that. But also I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to have another book on the shelf that was just telling me what to do as an artist. I, I'm actually insulted by that. I like, I only like to share with people um, as much as I can, as much as, as I can help it, if, if people ask me for their opinion, I'll give it to them. But I have found a lot of books, except for a couple books, were, were written by, art, by people who weren't artists. So I didn't feel like I was very understood. And what I couldn't find on the bookshelves were how artists really sustained a creative life. Like somehow in our community, we have difficulty talking about money. I think we should talk about money because the more transparent it is, the more maybe things would be more equitable. And I really believe that it's very important. So I said, okay, I'm gonna choose 40 artists for the first book to start a conversation about how to sustain a creative life. How I chose those artists were really not thinking a lot. I chose people that I, 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 some people I didn't know, but I chose people that I knew that could be truthful. And when you know someone well enough, you can tell if they're telling the truth or not. Mm -hmm. So I chose those people in the first book just to start a conversation. I had no idea that that book would be sold in 24 countries and in its seventh printing, none. And I still can't really read it because I'm afraid I'll find a typo. <laughs> um, but the second book was much more intentional. So in that book, I felt, why don't I try to create more of a community for myself from this and others? So I, um, at half the people in the book, I didn't know. And I made it much more diverse, um, that second book. And I really wanted artists to, to cite artists who could really share, not only have a leg in the commercial art world, but also how they give to others in their communities. For both books, and all of my books, including my third book, which is called Last Artist Standing, Artist Over 50, that will be launched at the College Art Association in February 2020. Everybody has to be generous. So for me, I can't work with people who aren't generous. If, uh, there are a lot, of narcissistic, a lot of narcissism in our community, and I just don't have a tolerance for that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So in, in past talks, you've communicated the importance of escaping the New York bubble. 
and taking the tour to cities across the United States as well as Australia. And in so many ways, this animates and performs the ideas that have been shared within your book. What have you drawn from this, this enterprise, this tour? What opportunities have been discovered? What frustrations have emerged? It's great. Um, you know, no one's really asked me any of these questions in the last five years, so it's really, I'm really grateful for them. Um, on both tours I've met, 11,000 people have come to these events. Um, and then I correspond with everyone. Um, it may take me, I mean, I just replied to emails from January <laughs> last week. Um, it takes me a long time sometimes to get back to people. Um, I've learned a lot. My husband and I did that to ourselves. It's also a, a myth that the publisher does everything for you, like an art gallery does for you. It doesn't happen. <clears throat> it's really a partnership. So my publisher and my distributors, uh, Intellect, University of Chicago Press, UCP, and then Yale University Press, who did the international uh, distribution for the second book, uh, they were all amazing in publicity and helpful in different ways, um, in a lot of different ways. And Intellect really also gave funds towards the book tour. But for the most part, we raised funds for that book tour as a uh, fiscally sponsored entity. We raised a lot of money to get artists across the country. And we also worked with venues um, such as Allison uh, at University of North Texas and many other places like 21C in Cincinnati. Um, and that was an exercise in sustainability because every artist has to be paid and there are different economies how they can be paid and every artist can determine what that payment is. We all have a responsibility as artists to determine what's good for us, what we need and want and ask for. We, I, I, I disagree with the other entity determining that. So what I learned from that tour is a lot of people um, think that the art world is of the art world in the 1980s. I learned that when I went to Tasmania. I learned that when I went to many different places across the country. I have a fourth book coming out, co-editing with Jessica Lynn, who's the uh, co-founder co of Arts Black. Uh, she is an amazing critic and fantastic, 25 years younger than me, um, of citing people in the art world of who they are today. Who is the museum director today? Who is the um, curator today? Who is the critic? Because I want to reframe who we are. But artists are still falling into the, this gap to think that the gallery is going to save their lives a lot of times. And a gallery is just one part of the ecosystem that's actually not true. So of all of the research that I've done, many, 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 many artists for my third book, 700 that I've gone through to get to 40, my second book, 40, uh, 400, is that in, in listening to galleries, they want that partnership. But as you can probably see too, not every gallery can take the millions of artists that are out there. So that's only one way to be able to um, contribute to a life. But I know very few people who sustain a creative life just from gallery sales. It's unpredictable, I'm sure you would know the same. So what does an artist do then? We lead our own path. We create our own opportunities. We create our own partnerships. And what's so great about that is that we get to cite who's in our community, who we can partner with and develop these long relationships with. I don't see that as work. So that, those are some things that I learned. But I also learned that outside of the bubble of New York City, there are a lot of amazing artists and communities. Oh my god, this is an amazing community. You all, I love craziness uh, and passion, and I feel it here. Colleen is amazingly passionate enough to contact me, you know, for me to be here. But also Baltimore is incredible. Las Vegas is incredible. That community I, I love, and I would probably live there if, if I, all of my friends, a lot of them good friends were in New York. But you can find them all over the world, and also in Toowoomba, Australia, in the middle of nowhere. There's these two artists uh, who are doing this project called Ray Gun, who show people from all over the world, but it's a garage. Incredible. Mm. I mean, I'm now in a lather thinking about it. <laughs> so I hope now, and you've kind of led into this, that we can delve a little bit more deeply into the inner workings of the unwieldy creature, creature that is the art world. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm gonna start sort of from the youngest demographic. Um, many young art students agonize over what path they should take to find a successful and sustainable career in the arts. Right. We know that the conventional avenues of finding a gallery or curator straight out of school are rare and often unsustainable. What advice do you offer for the art student of today and tomorrow? Um, yeah, I get asked that a lot, actually. I think the first thing I would say is you have to determine what success is. I think everybody has a different determination of what that is. Um, for me, success is being healthy. Success is being healthy, but also success is having an amazing, these amazing close friends of mine that I have and my inner circle. Um, that's success for me. Um, when I was in my 20s though, success was showing at a gallery, getting my work into MoMA, which is not on my list of priorities now um, for many reasons. Um, but I think the thing is, the first thing is to find your community is number one because I don't know if this is the case for you. I would like to ask you. A lot of dealers that I know, and some of my very good friends are gallery dealers. There's a couple of them I'm very close with. Um, I consider them close friends. And they actually get a lot of recommendations from their artists. And curators I know do too, right? Would you say from other artists? For sure. And then um, museum directors, they listen to artists, all different people in the art world, museum directors, curators, et cetera. So artists helping other artists is hugely important. And so if you're gonna stay in your white box, you will die in that white box, honestly. And I think a big part of the problem with the art world is because we have, artists have given to way too much power over to these other entities. So we've been stuck in that, in this, in our, uh, in our heads to just go for that white box. And then people are very bitter when they can't get there. Well, they also have to blame themselves for not extending themselves into different places. The other thing I would say is that think out of the box. So what I mean by that is in all different ways, do your research and finding your community. That might mean follow other artists' paths, look at their resumes, look at blogs who they're talking about. Everybody know hyperallergic? Hyperallergic, hyperallergic is really great, right? I mean, anybody who doesn't know it, I would say you must subscribe to them. I have a big bias towards them. I think they're amazing and um, they, they, they give me hope in, in my life. But there are many other blogs and online publications that offer information. It's not just what, what, they're, what they're writing about, but also the paths that you can follow about who you feel like you have a connection to, whether it's a writer, curator, or, a, um, uh, or an artist, and putting them on your mailing list and sharing with them what you're doing. Cre do an open studio, create an opportunity so people can come. Have a reason for people to show up. I think oftentimes artists get frustrated when they send something to someone and say, um, I want you to come for a studio visit and they never get back to them. Well, you're busy, I'm busy, and I know that dealers work Tuesday through Saturday and they have two days to do their laundry. I mean, there's a lot of practicality here that people don't think about. And so how can we cultivate relationships? I think you cultivate them in ways like befriending people, but you reach out to people who you really want to have a collaboration with and not a collaboration like changing your work, but a collaboration that um, is about um, two people who think the same, similar way to be able to collaborate on an experience together. Yeah, that's great. So we know that, that schools are producing more artists and curators today than ever, and the art world is increasingly more global with the technological tools that we have at hand today. The market often feels oversaturated, and yet there are also more avenues to show work to the public outside of museum galleries, including social media, pop-up shows, apartment galleries. What do you feel is the best way to navigate this new frontier? Oh my God, there isn't. <laughs> I don't know, what, what's the best way? What do you think, you're a curator, what do you think? Like I, should I take Yes, that? you answer the question. <laughs> I often say when I'm speaking to classes, like I say that the curator is no longer the gatekeeper. Like I think that you say like from that traditional point of view, it was the idea of I'm gonna toil in my studio until I get discovered oh. and then that unlocks the world. And yet I find that there are so many opportunities and I feel like more and more students and young artists 
artists of any generation are more entrepreneurial, and so like you say, they make their own opportunities. Right. Instagram can become your gallery, Correct. or we just do a pop-up show right. in an abandoned storefront, right. or someone sets up something in an apartment. Right. And like you say, I think if you build some kind of mystique around it, you're like, this is something new. Right. And I find myself chasing like the right. little events around exactly. town. Exactly. I'm like, oh, I, did, I heard about this from this person exactly. and that person. So, you know what? You just gave a lot more validation, <laughs> which I have a problem with, actually. Nothing to do with you personally. But the fact that you're a curator, they're going to listen to you much more than they're going to listen to me. And that's also a problem, you know? Yeah. So, like, that, I think it's great, though, that validates exactly that premise. Mm -hmm. And it's true. It's like, if you do your own thing, you know, artists are leaders, too, right? We, we are leaders. Sometimes we don't think that we ha uh, know our assets and know that we have that power. And it was only until I was 38 years old, God, all those years before I wasted, where I finally was so exhausted with caring, that I said, screw it, I don't care, I'm gonna do my own thing. Lo and behold, I've started getting a lot more of responses, I started Paving my, paving my own way. And actually, I, I just had an amazing residency at the Sharp Valenta Studios, which is um, a free studios in New York. And if that's a bunch of research I just gave you, or one research, you can write that down and apply. Um, Sharp, S-H-A-R-P-E, Valenta. So I'm very grateful I had that. I'm very aware how competitive that is. And so because that was a privilege, I had to share that. So I had people come in and we drew together in my studio at times. But then I also shared that studio and did a collaboration with Rog Vertanian and I did a year long installation. So I thought, screw it, I'm not gonna do the, have, just have this for galleries to look at my work. I'm actually gonna make my work in the studio because I need to do that for myself at this moment. And because of that sort of, in a way, not being beholden to a system, but actually saying the system and people in that system I collaborate with, we have exchange, I respect it because people are behind that, and it's very hard to be a dealer right now, and I, I have a lot of respect for those who pay artists, not for those who don't. Um, so I feel like that it's just being aware of that role, of that place in our community, and to be humble, but not to feel like I'm, I'm beholden to it, you know? So I think that to answer your original question, there's, I think that people have to find their own way what's gonna be good for them. Like I'm not, I, I'm a private person actually, because I'm so public, but uh, so I'm not, I, I keep my friends very close to me and I have an inner circle that's very small. But I, I would say, though, I'm very comfortable on social media where some people are very shy and they can't, don't want to get out there, but the social media then is an asset for them because they don't have to leave their house and they can just do things through the computer, but they have to find their own way. So there's no way um, that's good or bad, right? But I think what you said is tremendous because it's very true. I think those who set a path and believe in their work enough um, and are not beholden to trying to get things in order to fill this sort of checklist of what success is are actually far more, quote, successful. Right. So another kind of trope of the art world is that <laughs> we, we continue to we'll fetish. We'll never leave. There's yeah. so many of them. <laughs> I've got 14 more pages of questions here. <laughs> We continue to fetishize the young, new, and emerging art star, but there are a number of artists who have been practicing for years, if not decades, right. mm -hmm. still looking for the right opportunities or the dream show. Right. Your next book, Last Artist Standing, right. will focus on artists over the age of 50. Right. What have you found thus far in terms of overarching concerns and shared advice? Yeah. So I'm right, I'm right in, thank you for that. I'm right in the middle of that. I just sent the guidelines to them. You know, people over 50, I'm 54, are very opinionated because they don't care anymore. So it's, this book is going to be very controversial um, because my editing is not about the content. I know who I asked. Um, so I'm a little terrified of that, actually. Um, but I think that's good to be on our edges, I mean, on edge of my seat. Um, what I've learned is that uh, 
artists over 50 um, who I've picked for my book, but who I find are not stuck, are those who can work with people through generations. So they work with younger individuals, they work with older individuals, they've been doing things on their own, they're not beholden to a system, uh, they're not bittered, they're, they're maybe bittered about their health, which is understandable. I am too. Um, I'm not happy about aging, I don't think anybody is. Um, they may be bitter about politics, which is great, and um, they're more outspoken. Um, but I think that it was, it, that book is very hard for me. I still have a couple slots open. I actually, this is recorded, I shouldn't have just said that. Um, <laughs> tomorrow they're gonna be done. Um, but I, I got over, seven, over, I think over 700 suggestions for that book. Um, I vetted over 700 people for that book. Um, the, it's, it's, it, the most difficult part of it was that a lot of those artists haven't grown through generations. Like some of them are still stuck in thinking about a art world that doesn't exist anymore. Um, I have a couple friends of mine who are in their 80s who don't have uh, a cell phone and they don't have a, smart, oh, a smartphone, they have a cell phone at all. They have an old computer, they have a still taped voicemail. They're wonderful, I love them, uh, but they always seem to be behind on the news, for example. Like, I'll never forget when Robin Williams died, they called us three days later to tell us that he died. So the point of that is, is that some artists are still I'm exaggerating, but I'm using a metaphor, sort of stuck in these ideas that um, beholden to one way of sustaining a life. Look, in the 1970s, as you well know, there were not as many artists at that time who were professional coming out. There was also not, um, the ratio of galleries to artists was much closer than it is today. So you can't apply the, the uh, ways in which artists sustain a creative life today from the rules from back then. And I think what some people growing up through old academic systems are adopting that, which is very dangerous and terrible, and actually irresponsible of academic institutions who aren't doing the right thing by being contemporary in offering professional development in many different ways. I'm not talking about cookie cutter professional development, meaning not just your resume or, or artist statement or blah, blah, blah. I'm meaning actually how do artists sustain a creative life from all different views. So that has to catch up. And I learned that through this process of interviewing a lot of uh, people who are over 50. Hmm. Okay, well, speaking of reconsidering tenets, and you've kind of alluded to this already, this is, but this is one of the major points sort of within your, the books and the, and the speaking tour, is money. Money, yeah. money has been a sensitive, if not taboo, topic in the art world, with many feeling it's crass and compromises artistic ideals. One couldn't be accused of selling out or explicit commercialism and still maintain a respected practice. But we all need to make a living, and your book and your tour have advocated for open and honest conversations about money. So I'm going to lay out a few of them. What are your thoughts on the day job, artist unions, barter, microeconomy, and how to make compensation a more accepted topic? Oh, I love this question. Uh, first of all, there's no such thing as a day job. No such thing as a day job, because whatever job we choose to have, we're still an artist. We don't lose our identity. I think that's a ridiculous term, and I'm trying to get foundations to throw it out. It's an old way of thinking. I also don't believe in teaching artists either. I don't believe in that term for the same, similar reasons. I love unions. I wish there was an artist union. Has anybody ever heard of wage? Wageforwork.com. Wageforwork.com. Um, they just started Wagency for artists. We're, we're going towards that. Um, what did you talk about, micro, micro economies? Bart, barter, micro Oh, economy. barter, oh, there's all different economies. Yeah. I, I think that um, how uh, somebody, if an artist is going to, let's say, have a exhibition um, and the venue doesn't have enough money, uh, maybe the artist can be mindful of what they need and want and say, okay, 
if you don't have enough money, can you share my, your mailing list with me? Because that's a currency. Can you share photography? Can you take photographs for me? Um, could you pay for framing? Um, but that's on us to ask, actually. It's not dependent on the other person to figure out what we need and want. So there's all different ways of thinking of that. Um, and I think artists have the capability of doing that because when we're in our studios, somehow we um, don't collapse after, let's say, let's say just uh, who's painting here? Who, know, who does paintings here? Okay, so let's say just, just maybe all of us have painted at one point, but just bear with me. Let's say you put a, something, a, a brush stroke down and you make a mistake. Are you gonna say, oh my God, I failed and I can't recover. I can't paint again, right? Why is it that, we don't do that, right? We can start things from nothing, right? We have a, 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 a glob of clay or blank canvas, right? We can, we can start things from nothing, which is a lot of courage. And then we can also recover from failure in our studios fairly quickly without blinking. But why is it that when we don't get a grant, somehow we die, right? Like we can't, we seem to take um, rejection as something personal. I don't think rejection is personal. I think it's a, it's a um, I always say this, and now I'm, I'm forgetting my, my thing I say all the time in this tour, it's a difference of opinion. Because quite frankly, and I served on six juries this year, which almost killed me, but it, the thing is is that I love doing it though, because I learn so much, and I think every artist should serve on a jury, and every artist should also be on a board of something and follow Colleen's path in doing all of her nonprofit work. Everybody should talk to her and know her before you leave. So honestly, I mean, everybody here should take notes of that because the more we're vested in these systems, the more we have a say, the more we actually can cultivate community, the more we can raise the value of the arts today. So I would say that um, no such thing as a difference of opinion, I mean, a rejection, difference of opinion, because it's random oftentimes. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Can you actually validate that for us? <laughs> I'm giving you a lot of power. No, complete. And I, you know, I'm, I'm coming from more in the Canadian system. There's more of a granting sort of public yeah. support for the arts, a number of juries, grants available. But you're right, I, they would encourage artists to apply every year because it's also okay. intensely subjective at times right. where you'll have a jury of three people who will love a particular type of work right. and then the next year there'll be three. And so it's never, like you're right, it, it, just the alignment of sort of when those right. resources will be available is, is, you're right, it's never sort of something that it's like one, one failure will forever be condemned. It's, you know, it's, it's the opportunity to continue to try because you're just gonna find, hopefully, that right niche, that right opportunity, that right platform. Can I add to that? To the, I know we're going off on a tangent, but the best thing, too, about grants, and grants are, are not sustainable. They're Band-Aids towards sustainability. So, if, it, it, because they sustain you for a little bit, and hopefully during that time that you get the grant, you can figure out ways of using that time to sustain further. That's what it does, it enables you to move forward. But what's so great about grants, and Hassan Alahi, who's one of my core faculty at Chautauqua, who's amazing, he, um, he has always said, and he has this great point, that you should apply for things that fit because the people who see your work oftentimes are on a lot of juries, which is true for me, I'm sure that is for you too, that I see the same people apply, I get to know them, and one time I was on a, a grant panel in Alaska, and I was really fighting for this artist who I really wanted to get a grant, but she didn't get it, because I didn't win against the other panelists, and that's what happens too, like sometimes one person's real advocate for you, right, and then other people just won't agree, and it has to be consensus. Well, I called her, I, or I emailed her. I said, I'm in Alaska, I would really want to do a studio visit. And um, she I couldn't tell her how I knew her because the, 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 it wasn't announced. I just said I found her work, which was, wasn't lying exactly. I found her <laughs> through the grant process. So anyway, we went to her studio in Fairbanks. It was amazing. She's really young. She just got out of basically not that long ago graduate school, but I see the hope in her. And she's a fantastic person. Anyway, she applied for this uh, gallery show this summer, and her work fit in the context. She knew I was during, so I put her in that. I remembered her from that. And then she was, I guess, 
had a spark to come to New York City for the first time, and I just had breakfast with her two days ago, introduced her to my gallery. That's what I'm talking about. And this is not an anomaly. This actually happens often. So if you do the research to see where it fits, your work fits. Now, if you apply to places where your work doesn't fit, you may offend people because you're wasting their time. So don't do that. Don't just apply for everything like, what is that called, a shotgun, um, you know, all over the place. I shouldn't say that, actually. That's terrible, what I just said. That, I take that back. A blanket. Up. Yeah, darts or something. Yeah, or, or <laughs> pinballs or tennis balls. You know, we're, you're shooting everywhere, and it, it, hits, it hits places. Um, that, and then the odds are against you because you're wasting people's time, and you might annoy people. And actually, there are lists in the art world, unfortunately. So I talk to a lot of museum people, and they've all informed me that there are lists which of people who are difficult, who actually um, are problems, uh, and for many reasons, and they won't work with them. You don't want to be on that list. <laughs> But I think it's, you've raised something, and I think we should sort of talk about it. It's not on my question list, but there, I think artists also have to exercise some caution because I feel there's also a lot of predatory sort of exhibitions or award shows where the artist needs to pay a submission fee. Oh yeah, we can or totally talk about that. There are that. times when an artist will come to me and go, well, there's somewhere in Florence or Venice that wants to show my work, possibly, but I have to pay $500 in the shipping and this and that. Are you serious, $500? And they'll ask me, is this legit? Like, do you think that this is real or is this an organization that's essentially funding itself through artist submission fees or asking for donations of work and so, I've seen this more and more sort of become commonplace and just wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. Okay, so I've written about this um, three times. Um, one about, and I'm very vocal about it, and I wish more artists were vocal about it because then we could change the system. But a lot of artists want to complain and not do anything about it, which I have a problem with that, actually. I shouldn't be one of very few people who talk about this stuff, and I'm glad you brought it up. So for Chautauqua, for example, there's a $25 submission fee. That goes all to slide room. That's that, um, that takes care of that application fee, and for everybody who applies, I'm gonna give them feedback on their work. I already did that this year for a very big um, application. It was 742 people applied, and 64 people got in, something like that, and I gave everybody feedback who didn't get in, um, but and I was only paid two hundred fifty dollars. That's not equitable, but I did it anyway because I wanted to prove a point. I think if artists have a problem, they can do whatever they want. They can apply for whatever they want. But if they have a problem with that submission fee, they should ask where it goes. They should ask where it goes. I personally have a problem with these submission fees actually paying for the artists who get in, and on, and it's on the backs of the artists who don't get in. But why don't people ask about where it goes? So I had a problem with the Hopper Prize, which actually somebody just called me about today. Has anybody heard of that? The Hopper Prize seems like it's a sham. They haven't sued me yet. They haven't said anything yet. I'll keep talking until they do, and then I might sue them back. I don't know. Um, I can't really afford that right now. Maybe somebody will do that for me. But anyway, the point is, is that um, they charge a lot of money for getting on, in front of these curators, and I just want to know where it's going. It would be great that it was transparent, and then we can all make a decision for ourselves, is it worth doing it or not? Chances are likely if you apply for a, an application, or some kind of opportunity, your, your work is not really going to be looked at for more than like 30 seconds, and you're probably not going to get a lot of feedback from it, if at all. So you have to make a decision if that's worth it or not. But quite frankly, I would like to see that gone. I would like to see that old practice gone. For Chautauqua, my, my advocacy is for artists, and I just got this job September 1st. It's gonna take me a while to get enough money and donations to be able to get rid of that fee, but also I want everyone to go for free. That's the ideal position. So I, I do think that at the end of the day, it's up to all of you and up to every artist to make the determinations as to what they want to do, but it may not really be worth it. I think you just do the work yourself to try to develop these relationships that are usually longer lasting than the opportunity of just that juried exhibition. Would you agree? Completely. Mm -hmm. So I know we're, we're getting close to seven now, so I've got a few more. 
I've got another question about artist as entrepreneur, but I kind of want to move on a little bit to, I'm going to really put you on the spot with a difficult oh, one here. Oh, go ahead. I feel like this is one of the most sort of pressing topics in, in, in art in contemporary art today. So one of the most heated topics is cultural appropriation. Oh. Um, with Dana Schutz's painting of Emmett Till and the Brooklyn Museum's hire of a white individual, Kristen Windmuller Luna, as a consulting African art curator, being two of the more visible and vitriolic controversies. The fear is a counteraction where ethnicities become siloed and creative professionals must stay resolutely within their own race. How do we find fruitful terrain moving forward? I think the artist first has to be responsible for their audience. I think number one, you have to know your audience. You have to be, you have to be able to bear the consequences of the work that you put out there. You really do. You have to be mindful of that inclusivity. You have to be mindful of the public and showing your work. You don't have to show your work, you, but you have to know about your work enough and have that responsibility. Honest to God, I really believe that. I do believe also artists speaking out and saying that uh, other artists to speak out against these actions of people who are hired or people even in the political realm um, that aren't serving us in one form or another. Um, I think it has to do with that mindfulness, absolutely inclusivity, knowing our audience. The whole Sam Durant thing mm -hmm. is a perfect mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. You know, that the Native community, why didn't the organization know in advance their own community and Sam Durant for that reason? Now he came back and he apologized. He tried to do the right thing at, towards the end, but um, as much as possible, we have to own our responsibility as artists. And, and that also has to do with how we conduct our business, and that has to do with our values, too, of who we select to work with. So the other day I was speaking to a class at Pratt, and I said, um, you know, if, if the NRA, for example, uh, wanted to commission you to do something, and yet you're against guns, would you do it? And somebody in the audience said, I would, because it's just work. And I looked at her and said, really? I mean, if you are against this yourself, personally, I would never do it, and I would actually speak against it. I would say, how can you give to the value of the arts, and yet have the stance that you have with the use of guns today. Now, I'm not against people owning guns. I'm just using this as an example if someone's against that organization. I'm not, I, I think everyone should have the freedom to live the way they wanna live in this country. No, no, unless they, it doesn't hurt other people, but unfortunately, some guns hurt other people. And that's a bigger subject. Now, with that said, nothing is pure as far as who funds things in, in the art world. You know, nothing is pure. Um, so you have to balance for yourselves, and artists have to balance for yourselves. What's the percentage that you feel that if this person or organization is giving X dollars to something and they stand for something, is that going to hinder you working with them, for example? And that's entirely up to you. And I didn't begrudge that person who answered that about the NRA. I just said to him, can it be more than work? The decisions that we're making, because we are thought leaders, we are artist citizens, we are thought leaders because our work is about um, our voices, our truth from how we started, I was saying, our visual vocabulary, how we communicate in the world, so how we communicate, the context by which we communicate, that's extremely important. But we position ourselves in those contexts. We have responsibility for those positions of where we put ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Well, okay, I've got a couple more, but I think maybe I'll open it up to the audience now. Um, so let's, uh, let's see if we've got some questions. Should oh, I, this is Shana, Erica I, Hess, who's an artist. Should I, should I take yeah. the <laughs> want to, Is that okay with you, or do you want me to take it to her? Oh, should we? Okay. Is there, I, can, I can just speak really, really loud. Oh, but maybe for the video. Can you stand up? Yeah. 
So this is Erica Hess, E-R-I-K-A-H-E-S-S. -S -S. And she came from Columbus, Ohio today to be here. So, and you should look up her work. And we know each other through Facebook and social media, and that's another way of getting to know people that we had never met until this evening, but I feel like I know her. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that really wonderful introduction. Um, it has been a pleasure getting to know you through social media. I actually discovered what she was doing probably about six years when I was working a day job, and I, you contacted me on Twitter. I and did? Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal to me. Oh my god, <laughs> I swear to my god. Um, because, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the idea of validation. You shouldn't have to have validation, but it was nice to have somebody who was a great artist and doing so much, um, kind of acknowledge what I was doing. But um, first I want to say thank you also for your generosity. I was also one of the artists that applied to that show at Trestle Gallery, where there was like 700 and some applicants. Um, and she did write back, and I couldn't believe that. It actually was stunning, because I've never had that type of response before. So thank you. And I can't imagine the time to do that. So thank you. Three weeks. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. You have so many things more. No, happen. well, thank you. Yeah, and so my question actually kind of goes back to the idea of time. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the tour you went on for your book, um, books plural, you hit, I mean, over 100 cities for one of them. And you were really driving that, you and your husband. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about why you made that decision that it was important to you to get to these different spaces. Because so many people hit like LA, New York, Philly, maybe Boston, and that's it. Um, so I th thank you for that. And thanks for sharing your work with me because I feel, oh my God, you're so nice. You not only got me here, but then you move the mic around. Um, the, thank you and thanks for sharing your work with me. I felt obligated because those people shared their work with me and it was $10, I should say. So Trestle Art Gallery is fantastic run gallery, artist run gallery, sorry, in Brooklyn. Everybody should um, be on their mailing list. They give amazing offers to uh, artists all the time. It was only $10 to apply. And I suggested to Trestle for all the 600 some people who didn't get in, their, their work should still be shown. So you know what Trestle did? They gave them a six month online exhibition on their website. So everybody got shown, which is amazing. That's what should happen. Um, and they, they were open enough to do that and responded. And that says a lot about them. And that says a lot what artists can do for other artists. And they're in Brooklyn, New York, and there's a lot of validation and a lot of wonderful, quote, exposure, even though you can die of exposure. No, but exposure, a good way. So uh, as far as the cities, they were actually stops. So I don't know if it was exactly cities, but and we have multiple stops in some places. Like we have four, well, no, we have four cities in Texas. Oh, I don't remember. But why did I go to those other places? Because it's, it's much more inclusive. New York is in everything. New York's a bubble. Um, I love New York, but I love it more because of the people in it. I, I was just sharing with Erica and her friends, amazing artists in this row right there, um, that uh, I had a house fire in 2013, Christmas night 2013 in Bay Ridge. And that was after we experienced 9-11. We were a block and a half from the World Trade Center. My husband, jazz musician, his um, studio was flooded by Hurricane Sandy. And so three times, okay, New York, we get it, we're out. So after living there for 25 years, we were like, okay, we need a break. So we moved to Minnesota for three years because Minnesota is the number one funder in the country for the arts per capita. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like $50 million or something. I mean, I hope somebody can quote me the exact amount of money, but it's a tremendous amount of money um, that actually the taxpayers in Minnesota um, put it in the Constitution to be able to put a percentage of their sales tax, I think it was, it is towards giving grants to artists. Isn't that fantastic? So I wanted to be in that love. And so I moved there for three years. And then uh, I learned a lot from being there and across the country. I already did that first tour. Um, but I moved back to New York because I missed my friends dearly, my inner core. I needed to be around them a lot. I just needed to know they were there at my age. But I, I tell you, if I didn't have that inner core, I probably would have gone to Las Vegas and these other cities. And I learn a lot from these different cities. Like, we went to Cincinnati here, and I learned a lot from the artists here, and I'm, I know I'm gonna learn a lot 
tonight from all of you in Dayton. And I, I feel like it's an honor and privilege to take those stories with me. And it's an obligation for me as a catalyst to then try to create opportunities for artists. So what I generally do is when I meet people and I know that they're generous and they're not jerks, I can use a lot of other words to describe some artists that I've met who are not exactly generous to other people. Um, if I meet these generous artists, then I want to try to connect them to other people to create opportunities as much as possible. So I think the people in these other areas, um, and me coming from New York, I can share my resources a lot with them. It's great. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. Everybody should meet her, and you guys should exchange your information. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm actually not kidding. You, I, it's crazy you, not to do that. I'm glad you laughed, though. That's so nice. We need a lot of laughter. So I wanted to ask you about you know, transparency with money. And yeah. I think kind of the attitude as an artist is that you don't want to sell your work as a commodity, and yet you're supposed to be able to live off of work. And I do see you said that. Well, but I feel like why, why are you, are you saying people that? people that are like, don't put their prices on your website. Oh, well, that's don't different. Market Okay. Like it's a product, you're showing your work. So I, I, I do see there's two kinds of you know, scenarios out there. So I wondered if you had an opinion on one I versus do. the other. Because clearly people are marketing themselves and selling work in that manner. And then there's the old school approach, I think, too. OK, of course I have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody here has opinions. We're all artists, we're, we're, right? And, Curators are, I know a lot of curators who are artists. There's so multiple hats. Are you an artist too? I'm in the utopian world of the not-for-profit sector. <laughs> <laughs> are you an artist too though? I'm Steven? a long hibernating artist. Too. You are! Yeah, yeah, yeah. See? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like these divisions. People think that if you're a curator, you're nothing else. Yeah. Or if you're a museum person, like Adam Lerner, I just saw him in Denver. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. oh, he yeah. is amazing. Yeah. He is in my fourth book. He is a museum director um, at Mo uh, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, or, uh, Contemporary Art Center in Denver. Anyway, he does so many things. Like he, you would never even guess he's a museum director from back in the day. Okay, sorry, I went off on tangent. <laughs> but as far as transparency, there's different ways of being transparent. If you don't put your prices on your website, it may mean you can negotiate, right? If you put your prices on your website, you're fixed to that. Right? It, also, if you put your prices on your website, you may discourage people. If you don't put them on there, you could receive inquiries. So it's a different way of marketing. It's th that there are different ways to be transparent, right? Um, you can voice things in different ways. Like, for example, if you have a problem with someone, but you don't want to say it, maybe you tell somebody in the press to say it for you, right? That's a way, I, I, I absolutely think everybody should go to tips at hyperallergic.com if they have issues and feel like there's relevance and can speak on your behalf. If there, if, if also if there um, are ways in which to be transparent about money, you can actually ask for certain things, like put the prices on price lists because that's actually against the law not to do that. I think that's in New York City or New York State, but it may be applied elsewhere. So insist that that happens. Um, insist that you can be open and say what your prices are how, and also be aware of what your discounts are gonna be in advance. Be prepared for that. But your question bothers me because the, what, what bothers me is an, it's sort of an old idea and feeding into that idea of that validation of only sustaining a creative life by the sales of, of work. I tell you, my gallery, who I, I have four galleries, I like them all very much, but if I lived off of sales from them, I would probably be homeless. I, I would not be able to sustain a creative life. And they serve different purposes for me than just the sales part. And other people also conduct sales, and there's different ways of getting sales of work. It doesn't necessarily have to be the work itself. It can be other ways to sustain life. I, make, I do museum commissions. Um, that's how I mostly sustain my life, but also of the other things. But I try to create those opportunities myself. 
um, but I am very transparent about them, especially when I'm asked about them. I think if you look at Wagency, they insist upon that kind of transparency, and that was just launched. So hopefully after some time, we can all get used to using a platform like that so that we can get used to saying more about it. And it's different ways of marketing. Come on, we have time for more questions. There's Janet. <laughs> Can you say who you are so you can um, introduce to everybody? I'm Janet Garlick. A couple of people probably actually know me. <laughs> could put the mic to your. There we go. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I don't sound that great. Um, so, you had mentioned early on in your talk that, um, that you, you used the term born with Teflon. Uh, born without Teflon. Without, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which I love. I love that. That's my therapist. I'll tell her. <laughs> Next week. So, um, what I'd like to know is how that affected your life, in particular, your art, me, your art career. Yeah. Well, I can tell you how it, how it affected me. How it affected me as a woman, because um, I'm a loud woman, and that's not that didn't really work for me for a long time. Um, and now I don't care, actually. Um, I, I am who I am, and I tried to change that. Um, and um, I think that's a lot of the case for a lot of women. Um, and I'm glad that things are changing a little bit, not as much as I'd like to see them change. I do believe there's a backlash right now, too, which we have to fight against. But for me as a woman, it was not having that Teflon coating and being not having a filter and still learning what that means. Um, but I feel like uh, I live one life and I'm born this way. And of course, I can, I desperately try to be a better person. Um, but my work did a lot for me to be, to be that truth that I could be, quote, loud in certain ways um, that I wasn't necessarily, quote, permitted, even though I don't need permission to be that way. Felt that I needed permission which is a problem. On this tour, um, one thing I would add too is that a lot of women have asked me for permission where men never ask me for permission. We don't need permission, we don't. Um, and in fact, the three things that artists need the most that I found on this tour are validation, which is normal because validation is human. We all need validation, but there's a difference between validation and appreciation and appreciation, we also need that. And we should ask for that appreciation if we're not getting it. Um, opportunities, absolutely, we can make them, absolutely. And then for women, permission, which we have to stop uh, asking for. Um, so that's a bigger issue. But that Teflon coating, not having it really affected me. And, um, and affected me mostly painfully with accept, lack of acceptance in my own family. But it is what it is. I found my own family, and I'm moving forward. And I'm, I feel also being a part of the cabal of the artist community is very comforting. We have time for one more question. Oh, no, two? Oh, gosh, Colleen. I have to pay you later. <laughs> Sustainability. There's the back, two. Back row, yeah. Oh, and I'm not forgetting you. No, <laughs> not okay. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? I'm Ellen Dunkley. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, I came a little late. I don't know. It's okay. Talking about artists as activists. What would your advice be for young artists as being activists today? Say again, how, uh, tell, me, tell me again. What would your advice be for young artists to be activists today? Like, yes. Do you have any advice for us? Yes. <laughs> I think the video can hear me. So, <laughs> my, is loud and clear. That's my last name. Um, oh no, you didn't have to walk over here. Um, Yes, I think to be themselves, like not ask for that permission. Thanks for that question. I think to create their own opportunities, not beholden to a system, but to work with a system. Those two things are different. Um, to be generous to other artists. 
Now, we shouldn't be afraid of sharing opportunities we find together or for ourselves. If it doesn't fit for us, it's going to be good for somebody else. But even if it fits for us, I'm happy to share that. Like on Twitter, I applied for Guggenheim, and two days before, I mentioned that this application was coming out, and people said, what when's the deadline? Well, I didn't feel like it was a competition. If somebody else gets it, that's great. Maybe the universe has a different plan for me, and not that I have to fit this square into a circle each time. I've applied for the Guggenheim eight times. I may never receive that in my lifetime, and that's fine, because I can get, hopefully, receive other opportunities that can go towards sustainability. But again, grants are just patches, and that's more towards like a validation, you know? But I would love also getting a grant is partnering with that organization. And every organization that I've received a grant from, I feel like I then continue to be partners with. That's the other thing as art as activists, what do you do in your community to create relationships with other partners other than artists? So what do you do in your community to volunteer to be on a board, to be able to work with organizations to share not only your time, but also your opinions and curate exhibitions, um, give opportunities to other artists, um, befriend other organizations. Um, I don't just work with organizations that give me grants. I'm actually on boards, uh, advisory boards for Oxbow and for other organizations that I feel really empowered to be um, contributing and, and I feel honored to lend my voice. So starting young and doing that is extremely important. Basically, be involved as much as you can, and, uh, but also take care of yourself at the same time. Don't forget who you are. I sometimes do that to a fault. That's the bad thing. Were you going to contribute to that? Yeah, I just want to chime in quickly. Um, I had the great opportunity of working with the artist Andrea Bowers. Oh, yeah. Um, who is from Ohio, actually, like a small town in Ohio. She now lives in, in California. But please read her interviews, her writings. She contends she is a very active, passionate ad activist. And she's also an artist and has found a way to entwine the two. And she wrestles with those questions all the time of, if I make work about activism, am I selling it as a commodity? And it really becomes like the DNA and the, the, the foundation of her practice. And I feel like she navigates it in a very savvy, um, intelligent, and sort of effective way. Because it can be very thorny, that idea of art. and then. If it gets translated into an object, are you then basically co-opting or selling your your ideals? But there's somebody like there's somebody like William Pohida who actually makes it into yeah. a full-on conversation through his work about the art world, mm -hmm. and he's an activist. And then there's also Jennifer Dalton, his often collaborator. I'm collaborating with her right now. And then there's uh, Lauren Monk. There's there's Michelle Grabner, there's so many artists out there who are doing, who are setting paths for other artists. But I'm glad you brought her up because yeah. I, I think that's a great example. Yeah. Okay, you had a thought. <laughs> What's your name? You don't have to be quick and direct. Well, you, it'd be great if you were direct. Um, so I'm wondering if we're thinking about artists as culture producer, if we're thinking about sustainability and working uh, in and amongst communities. What do you think the role of criticality is within the, of who? Of the role of criticality within our, our community? Criticality? Yeah. Essential. Essential. Oh, absolutely. Like, the critic, I was going to take a picture of you, actually. The criticality, because <laughs> you looked amazing, um, criticality is that, that for, for me, one of the things that I found with a lot of artists um, going across the state of Wyoming, thanks, I'm just fresh because I just came back from Wyoming like a, a couple, a week or so ago, or I don't remember actually, God, um, maybe a couple weeks ago, I don't remember. Anyway, um, when I was in Wyoming, most of the artists were asking about they want critical discourse. Um, you know what's interesting is that I think organizations are afraid of sharing feedback to artists because, well, first of all, they don't oftentimes have the staff to take that on. But I think it should be a requirement of organizations to give feedback or just reply. Um, but then again, artists also have to behave in certain ways and not also be desperate and just think about themselves because that 
I think about the other person is a really good thing to do as a human being anyway, but artists sometimes tend not to do that because we're isolated and sometimes in our own world. But I think that truth, actually, what I found, like, and it sounds really cliche, but truth will set you free, you know, really. I think artists, and Michelle Grabner and I were just talking about this at Oxbow, is that artists are not afraid, and in fact, the artists that I found, when I tell them that they're people can't be in my books, like I did an open call for my third book, and one person out of 350 got into that, um, out of the 40 in this book, and I had to tell them in a gentle way why, and I did, didn't write everybody individually, I, I apologize for mass um, uh, reply, but I wrote a long reply, and you know what I found, people were, like Erica was saying, people want receive that feedback and want that truth, so for each other we have to do that. We have to be brave enough to share each other's truth and not think of it as something that is going to be kill us or be this personal rejection. I do think a good artist is someone who can be a critic of their work and have objectivity. So we have to have a certain amount of objectivity. We have to be able to let go of our work. We have to be able the vehicle for our work, who drives the car, who determines the journey. And that even means if you get a referral from somebody to show somewhere, or like I said before, positioning, making the decisions of where we position ourselves, that's your on you. That's your responsibility. So to be able, you can also to be able to think about um, who we bring into our studios to receive criticality from. We can be smart as far as who we're bringing in. If it's someone who wouldn't understand our work necessarily or that visual vocabulary, why are they there in the first place? So thinking about who we want to have a conversation with and being able to uh, share truth is extremely important. Critical discourse is, uh, grows people, don't you think? Yeah, thank you, because it's funny. I wish I could do a case study between two artists I know in Cincinnati. There's, there's one that I can disagree with in such a productive way. Like, we oftentimes come at things completely from opposite ends, and yet we can have a conversation and we can respect one another's viewpoint, and I always find it so cathartic and sort of enlightening to have a conversation. And then there's another person who just is so rigid in their narrative and their story and their truth unfortunately, that there's no room for any kind of alternative feedback or interpretation or translation. And they're just polar opposites. But I feel like, you know, you say, like, we try to encourage at the CAC critical discourse because I feel like the sources of it are, are narrowing. You know, arts reviewers and arts writers are getting systematically pushed out of newspapers. Right. And, but then again, like we've got a whole host of online opportunities where you know, if you can find a legitimate, sort of educated, informed viewpoint and a group of people that want to write reviews and want to interview artists, I think there's so much opportunity to have more critical writing. But it's tricky. Like That whole ecology, I feel like, is still kind of in a, in, in a state of becoming. But there's also, like, the critical discourse is really important. Like, we did an event in, at 21C in Nashville. I went to all the 21Cs. And uh, somebody in the audience, and Patty Johnson, who's mm. a great blogger, oh, yeah. Art of City, she was in the audience. <laughs> and mm. she's a friend, and we live near each other in Queens. And she was in the audience, and I, I always ask what the artists need and want in these uh, events, or we, like in Cincinnati, pass out cards and answer questions and asking what they need and want. And one person right next to Patty went to her and said, I need writing here. I need that critical discourse. And the thing is, that comes from validation, that that community can write for each other. Sure, it's not the same, but it can then go into different places. Or that they did the work like Sharon Butler, who's Two Coats of Paint, who, and everybody should take note of her, twocoatsofpaint.com. She has a blog that she started for this reason. She wanted criticality in Mystic, Connecticut, and now it's an award-winning blog. She has 20,000 followers on Twitter, and um, she actually pays people to write in different communities, artists writing on other artists' work, and that creates a huge amount of validation and critical discourse. So it's, a, it's about not following the same places. And, it, and also the myth that if someone has their review in the New York Times that they're going to make a million dollars or change their life, that's a myth. That's really a myth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
Do you have any other questions? Do you have a comment left? left? Well, okay, if no one has a question, I want, we've got one and a half minutes left, so. <laughs> I'm going to ask you an impossible philosophical question oh here. Oh my God! Big, big, big ending. Okay, I'm going to take a picture of you while you ask no, me this. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to get misty as I write and ask this question. In the gallery museum world, we hear frequently that the greatest competition to visitation is not competing art forms, but rather Netflix, Instagram, and the screen-based economy, where a vast realm of entertainment is never farther than a cell phone away. How do the visual arts stay relevant and vital in the highly contested battle for attention? Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> yes, you told seconds. me! Yes, you told me you would be this way. Uh, we have a mutual friend in common. Um, she's amazing. Yasmin Siddiqui, she's awesome. And on my core faculty, amazing. Um, well, first of all, the value of the visual arts is pretty low compared to all the others. Because I think that part of it is because we've isolated ourselves in, in our exclusive club. So that's a problem. Um, I do think that when there's a crossover a little bit, and even if you're painting flowers, right, in your studios, I love paintings of flowers. Um, maybe we can show it somewhere else. Maybe we can collaborate with different people that aren't in the art world. I mean, the whole book is, on that premise, this book. Um, I mean, this book is about how artists create culture at large. I think the way that we have more value is to be able to identify ourselves. I mean, it's fundamentally change who artists are today. And that's what these books do too for me, is that who is an artist today? We have to educate the public. We also have to be out there more outside of the uh, traditional systems. And we have to find ways to collaborate with different organizations and then also find different audiences. So you mentioned my animation, I enter film festivals, that's a different audience, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'm conscious of the fact of doing things that are different that may be outside of the realm of the art world and not threatened by it whatsoever, but excited by it, actually, because it's new, and we create things from nothing, right? New, so different experiences that can enrich my growth, but also m allow me, in enriching my growth, learn from others. So it's sort of a win-win. I do think our presence on social media is really important, but I do think a really good Instagram account is not, or Twitter or anything, is not someone who's just promoting their work. I think that's really tired, and people, to me, I don't think it's as successful as others that can show a more holistic um, view, and that I, I get that advice from different dealers. Um, I do a, re a lecture series at the New York Academy of Art, and one time I uh, interviewed the dealers from Sargent's Daughters, Meredith and Allegra, and they said that. They say they find people on Instagram from just a more holistic idea rather than just showing the work over and over and over and over again. So we can change how we position ourselves and where we position ourselves and how we think about um, the divisions in the art world not being so divided. Um, and then also position yourself. I just wanna say one more thing. The other thing is, I want to mention in values, like for example, art form. Art form is in trouble right now. It seems like the art world's just forgotten that, that actually someone, Amanda, um, and I've forgotten her last name now, um, bravely said that the publisher engaged in sexual harassment. And um, the art form has countersued that person. And I have, I'm not gonna pick up that magazine until they change, until that suit is over. Um, but it seems though the art world has forgotten that, that we've gone back into business as usual. And I think that with this validation and value, increase of value, forms of validation, increase of value, we can't just go back to where we were. Mm -hmm. not, not just the values, but also how we think about our work and not just slide back into our normal habits of getting a gallery show. It's so boring getting a gallery show. I mean, really, what does that do? Does it guarantee sales? Probably not. Most galleries don't sell everything or, 
or maybe sometimes not at all during the time of the exhibition. They often sell after, if at all. But what does it do? Does it change your life? Does it? Does it really change your life? So like thinking if we can keep going and take those risks and being uncomfortable in changing our audience or thinking of who our audience is outside of the art world, we can maybe increase that value. That was a lot to say, sorry. <laughs> thank you. It has been a pleasure. Sarah. Thank you and thank thanks you. to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, thank you so much. That was so much fun, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>